And so I'm going to ask if you'd please stand up with me as we have our, our reading of the scripture this morning. We're going to have two uh, scriptures this morning. You can follow along on the screen or in your Bibles, but I just want to make you aware uh, two different ones. The first one will be from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, as well as a section from Acts chapter 3, uh, verses 17 through 26. So I'll go ahead and read, and I could say this is the word of the Lord. If you would just join me uh, afterward, we could say thanks be to God together, because we are thankful that he is speaking his word to us, and so we want to be ready. So let me read. This is, this is the word of the Lord from 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 5. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given At the proper time. And now Acts chapter 3, starting verse 17. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did all your rulers, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have, who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaim these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, go ahead. You can have a seat now. So... Today we're looking at Christ as the mediator. Christ is our mediator, and he came to bring um, two parties that are at odds together again. And so let's ask our question and start with our our learning from scriptures today. Uh, Why did Jesus need to come to earth? Uh, Our first point for this morning is this, is that Christ is the mediator who came to reconcile God and mankind. Christ is the mediator who came to reconcile God and mankind. Let me go ahead and first uh, deal with these two things, the word Christ and the word mediator. Uh, The word Christ, we use that all the time. It's not Jesus' last name. It's actually a title. Christ is the Messiah. Christ is actually just the Greek word for the Jewish word, Hebrew word, Messiah. And so whenever we see that word Christ, we should think Messiah. And Messiah is God's anointed one, the one that God chose to do his will and the one who who God commissioned for a purpose. Let me read in in John chapter 1, starting in verse 40, how this idea of Christ and Messiah come together. Uh, Verse verse 40 of John chapter 1. This is talking about the disciples now, talking about Jesus. It said, one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. See here, we see so clearly that John is making known that the disciples who saw Jesus and understood that Jesus came to the scene, they were expecting a Messiah. They were expecting God to send a man and one of his people who would be a divinely authorized agent of God, Messiah. The Messiah just means anointed one. Uh, we don't necessarily do anointing these days all that much, but anointed one was often somebody who was, had, was anointed with oil, and they were anointed with oil. It was like a ceremony. They were maybe on their head, poured it out on their head, but it was somebody who was d- divinely commissioned by God for a specific job, right? They were anointed. And so the Messiah was God's man. He was God's man come to do God's will. And so Jesus is that man that God has commissioned to do God's will. And so that's why we call him Jesus the Christ. He is God's man to do God's will. Well, he's not only the Christ, he's not only the Messiah, the anointed one from God, the one chosen by God to do an important special task. He's also 
specifically, what, the, what is that task? The mediator. And we'll read again what we read from this uh, earlier, which is 1 Timothy verses, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. It says, For there is one God. We believe in one God. We are not polytheists. We believe there is one God. And there is one mediator between God and man. See, there, a mediator is somebody who goes between, the, in this case, God and man. The man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. See, there's all different kinds of mediators we have in the world. Um, there's different mediators for, say, business. Maybe there's some difficulties that have happened between businesses, between businesses and clients, and sometimes there's a need for business mediation. Well, that's somebody to help uh, come to a resolution. There's also mediators um, in education. We have different intermediaries between different le le levels and layers of education, from administration to staff to parents. We have people who go between to make sure that communication happens rightly, people understand what is going on, what our goals are together. So we have education, we have business. Uh, we, we have family mediators. Do you know anybody in your family who is often the peacemaker, who is able to talk to both sides of people who, who are maybe having trouble, or maybe they can, they can understand both sides? Uh, those are people of peace. Those would be mediators relationally. Well, the difference between those type of mediators and Christ is that all of those mediators are horizontal. All of those mediators are between people and people. And at its essence, those, those levels of horizontal mediation, they can only get you so much peace, right? Because when we're dealing with each other, and we're dealing, we, we only have the enough ability to have as much peace as the groups in the, involved will let you have peace. Well, Jesus is a different kind of mediator. He's a mediator between us and God. I mean, we, we, think about this for a sec. We need a mediator between us and God. Why? Because we are not like God. In the equation, in terms of power and knowledge and, and every part, I mean, there's, there's nothing. If you stack God versus humans, there is no comparison. In fact, how is it even possible that humans can be in some sort of relationship with God? It's only because he condescended from on high to stoop down to us, to be able to know us, to, to show us, to speak to us, to, to love us, to have us know anything. We are on the receiving end of this relationship. So no human, no mere human, could be a mediator between God and man. It had to be a special, special human because we, we need a mediator between vertically, us and God. In fact, um, that Jesus is that one mediator. There's no other mediator between God and man because God, Jesus is the God-man. Jesus is the one who could go between both God and man. He's not merely a man. In fact, he needed to be both God and man. And think about this. God set it up that he would send his son to be a God-man. Okay, humanly speaking, I don't think any of us, in fact, the Jews and nobody else, nobody thought that up. Nobody could have come up with that plan. Only God himself could have come up with a plan with saying, well, I'm God, you're my creation, I'm going to send my son to be, take on flesh just like you. That was, I mean, that was actually in some ways blas, blasphemous in some ways to be able to put God down on our level. In fact, this is one of the truths why uh, uh, Islam does not believe in Christianity because they think it's blasphemy that God could have a son. The blasphemy that God could ever have touched human flesh in any sort of way. He is so other and separate than us. But no, God chose from eternity past that he would send his son, the second person of the Trinity, to be a mediator between God and man. It's a wonderful thing. Praise the Lord for that. Let me read um, in John verse 1, 1 and 2, and then 14. We read it earlier, uh, parts of it. So let me read. That. In the beginning was the word, and that word is, is Jesus. And the word was with God, see, next to him. And the word was God. See, God, Jesus is God. And he was in the beginning with God. And then verse 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's not just God. He's not just with God. He is God. And he became flesh. He took on flesh. Now, he didn't lose his divinity. That, none of that went away. No, no, no. He just took on. He added to a human nature. Praise the Lord. So let me um, talk about how this idea of Christ being the mediator and Christ being, really, Christ is the Messiah, the anointed one. Um, there are different offices, is what we'll call, different jobs or functions that uh, Messiahs could, could take. 
One of them is the office of a prophet. Let me show in, first, in Psalm 105 uh, how anointed ones were connected to prophets. So in Psalm 105, starting verse 14, this is God speaking about, uh, God speaking here, or about God. It says, he allowed no one to oppress them. God allowed no one to oppress his people um, at, at certain times. It says, he rebuked kings on their account, saying, touch not my anointed ones. There's that word for Messiah. Touch not my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. And this is Hebrew poetry, so we're talking about anointed ones is the same thing as prophets. So we're seeing here, God has anointed ones. Those are specially commissioned people for a task from God. Well, what was one of those tasks to be a prophet? So let's talk about exactly what is a prophet. Exactly what is a prophet. Some of you may just know this uh, intuitively, but let me just say it um, quickly here. It's that a prophet is a human agent chosen by God to receive and declare God's message as given by the Holy Spirit. A, a human agent chosen by God to receive. This is what makes a prophet a prophet. They, God chooses them and they receive the word of the Lord, right? God speaks to his chosen prophets. And it's then those prophets who receive God's word and then they give God's word. They are an agent of revelation. They are an agent by revealing God's will to, to the people. In fact, God used prophets throughout all the Old Testament. We see many, many different prophets. You may know some of their names, uh, Samuel, and Moses, and Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Micah. I mean, we literally have parts of our Bible that have the major prophets and the minor, minor prophets, and that usually has to do with the size. You know, we have major uh, size. It's not the less major or less important. It has, they're bigger, uh, the major prophets and the minor prophets. It's because God spoke through humans, and he anointed those humans so that he, they would receive God's word and give his message. Well, in the Old Testament, what we see is that those prophets, they were not mediators between God and men in the truest sense because those prophets were broken and sinful. They actually couldn't help breach the gap between God and men because their own sin got in the way. In fact, we see that in the book, in, in, uh, in, in the life of Moses. Moses was a prophet of God. Moses was a mighty man of God. He was humble. He had faith. And he, God gave him the word, and he, he talked to kings, he talked to Pharaoh, he talked to the people of Israel. There was mighty miracles. He was a mighty man of God. He was a prophet. And yet, he didn't enter the promised land because of his sinfulness. All human prophets were just a shadow of the need for a better prophet to come. And so, what God did in the Old Testament was he sent prophets, commissioned voices, if you will, mouthpieces, if you will, to be his voice to tell his people about God and what he requires. In fact, there was a, a prophecy given to Moses about a future prophet. Let me read it here. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, verses 18 and 19. This is saying, hey, there's a prophet to come. It says, I will raise up, the Lord says, I will raise up from, uh, for them a prophet like you, like Moses, from among your, their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever d will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. God spoke through Moses about a future prophet that was to come, and he was saying, this prophet really matters. There's one who's coming, I'm going to put my words in his mouth, and you better listen to that prophet. Because if you don't listen to that prophet, I'm going to do business with the person who rejects my prophet. I'll require it from him who does not receive my prophet that I'm prophesying. So why do we need Christ to be our prophet? We're talking about Christ as our mediator, and we're seeing Christ as a prophet of God. Why do we need him to be our prophet? If you're writing notes, you can put this down as our second point for this morning. Christ is not only the mediator who, who brings, reconciles God and man, but why do we need him to be this prophet? We need him to be a prophet because of this. Our first prophet, Adam, failed and left mankind in utter darkness. Our first prophet, Adam, father of all humanity, literally every single one of our parents finds their beginning in Adam. He is our father. He is our prophet he failed in the garden, and that left us with devastating consequences of sin 
left us in utter darkness. Let me read and show, not necessarily everybody has thought of Adam as a prophet, but we must think, we must remember, what is a prophet? It's somebody, God gives that person, he chooses a person to give them his will and his words so that that person would be responsible to give those words to the, to the other people. Well, that is exactly what God did. God chose Adam and placed him in a garden, and then he gave him his words. He gave him his commands of which he was responsible to give to ultimately his family and the whole world. So let's read this here, uh, Genesis chapter 2. This was in the garden before there was ever any sin. This is perfection here. uh, Verse 15. It says, The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord commanded, there it is, the word of the Lord came to who? This chosen man and commanded the man saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So this is God installing Adam, our father, as the first prophet of humanity. He was given God's word. He was chosen by God for a special purpose, to be the mouthpiece of God. He was given God's commands. And so now Adam was charged to tell his his wife, to tell his children, this is what the Lord requires of us. Follow the Lord. In fact, as we think about Old Testament prophets, what do they do? Old Testament prophets were preachers. They were saying, follow the Lord, thus saith the Lord. Whenever you see those words, thus saith the Lord, it's it's like a formula. It's like God is now speaking, and it's almost like the prophet saying, these aren't my words, these are God's words, you better listen up. They come with all the authority of God when I say these words. God has chosen to use humans to be his mouthpiece, and he chose Adam as our very first prophet. And what we see here is that Adam failed. Adam was given the commands of God, and he did not ensure that those commands were followed. Just like the prophets of the Old Testament, he's supposed to be a preacher of God's word, calling people to obey God's word and not to reject God's word. And so we see the temptation happening in the garden. Genesis chapter 3, the serpent comes in and tempts Eve. Uh, Verse 1, it says, And the serpent, he, the serpent, said to the woman, Did God actually say? Notice this is about God's words, right? Did God, he's he's testing, he's challenging uh, what God said. You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden. And God said, But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Now, what we see here is that Eve has some understanding of what she wasn't, she wasn't supposed to do. She wasn't supposed to be involved with a particular tree. Um, and what Satan does, the enemy of God, he comes in and tries to uh, pervert. He, he tries to distort God's word. Um, well, what we see is uh, Eve, Adam's wife, she knows the commands of God. Okay, good job, Adam. She knows. Because remember, God told Adam these words. Eve wasn't even alive yet during this time. Well, then Adam was doing the job of telling his wife what she was supposed to do, but she was tempted in the garden, and let's see how actually Adam starts off well, but then fails by not protecting God's word, by protecting his wife. Um, Adam should have stood up, just like the prophets of old. If If you're aware of your Old Testament scriptures, these prophets were not pushovers, right? Prophets were people who had to speak authoritatively on the word of God and say, repent, God, follow the Lord. Well, this was a point in which Adam should have said, Sat- or serpent, get out of here. Don't tell my wife. Don't tempt my wife. We follow the Lord. Eve, we follow the Lord. Don't get involved with that. Remember what God had said. He's playing the, the role of a prophet. He, Adam, should have crushed the head of the serpent. He should have stomped on that head and said, not here. This is God's garden. But let's see how he didn't do that. Verse 6, the woman, uh, Eden, falls and Adam with her. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And here it's so clearly, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. He failed in his role as being a prophet of God who was supposed to administer the word of God to call people to obey the word of God. And instead of following God's word, he followed his wife to disobey God's word. In fact, we know that that Adam was a prophet because look at what God says about 
uh, the curse. Let's look at uh, Genesis 13. I'm sorry, Genesis 3, starting verse 17. Look at the curse. Look at how God talks about the curse. It says, and, Adam, and to Adam, God is talking to Adam about, about his problem. He's, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, you should have been listening to my voice, Adam. I gave you a charge to have my words and for you to give those words to the world, including your wife and your children. You listened to the wrong authority. You had my words, but you listened to her words. You see that? So he's calling out even his, his uh, prophetic ministry as failing at that. And have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you. There's, there's commanding has to do with prophecy. Um, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Because Adam, our first prophet, failed, that now has terrible, terrible consequences. And now all of man is corrupt. We are now plunged into utter darkness. Unfortunately, there's bad news before good news. But there is good news coming. But let's understand this bad news. It's, it's the gospel uh, th that comes from the bad news. We see immediately, look at Genesis 6. We do not have to go very far to see just how corrupted man gets because they were not following the commands and the wisdom of God. Uh, let's see, verse 5 of chapter 6. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every, notice, every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Immediately, because Adam was not using his prophetic role, what happens? The world, mankind, grows in wickedness. And there's no help. There's no light in man at all. Look, what it's, look at the, the, the language there. Every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is the word of the Lord speaking about, about mankind. We are plunged into darkness because of sin. Not only that, Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3 says, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there is any who understand. Does anyone know? Does anybody have any light? Or are you all in darkness? Look what it says. It says, who, see, who seek after God. But no, there's no one who seeks after God. It says, they have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Humankind is completely corrupted. And look at this last part in verse 4 of the same passage. They have no knowledge. They have no knowledge. All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the name of the Lord. That's the Old Testament. Well, it's, it's still true and talked about in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 18 and 19 says, They, this is talking about the Gentiles, or really this is anybody without God. It says, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance. This is an important understanding. Why do we need Christ as a prophet? It's because we are utterly ignorant of God and his goodness. We are in utter darkness without God because of our sin. Because of the sin of Adam that we inherited as well as our own sin plunges us deeper and deeper into darkness. And it says, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, to every, uh, every kind of, of impurity. In fact, 1 Corinthians makes it really clear. If you do not have the spirit of God, you cannot understand the things of God. You are in utter darkness. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural person, that's the person without God, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able, it's not even possible for a person who does not have God to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. In order to understand God's things, you need to have the Spirit of God to understand them. In fact, we went through um, in the doctrines of grace in our, in our Sunday school this idea of total depravity, this idea of total inability. People do not have the ability to understand to know, to do anything good at all. Every part of a human faculty has been corrupted. Their mind, their hearts, their wills, and we're all in bondage to sin because of sin. This is the bad news. But it's this bad news that gives us the reason of why Jesus had to come, of why Jesus had to be the God-man mediator between God and man so that he can fix this problem. We need a prophet 
We need a prophet who could tell us the true words of God because every man who has lived after the fall has been corrupted. Even God, God, so God used corrupted people. But those people could never be a true, full mediator between God and man. They were corrupted themselves. And so how is it now, for our last point this morning, how is it that Christ is our mediator? How is it that Christ is now our mediator? Here's the good news. Here it comes. It's this. It's that Jesus Christ reveals the truth to us about God and about his will for our salvation. Jesus Christ reveals the truth to us. Jesus is the true prophet. Jesus is the prophet of prophets, of all prophets. He's the highest and mightiest. He is the God-man, the true mediator, the Christ, the, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who was chosen by God for a special task to be the prophet. And what does he do? He reveals. That's an important thing. If you, if you don't take anything else from this morning, remember this. Jesus Christ reveals God to us. Jesus Christ reveals God to us, and he reveals God's salvation for us. We need Jesus to reveal God and his salvation. So let's read some of that. In fact, I'll use the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Uh, we've been using lots of catechisms. Here's one from the Westminster Shorter, 1646. Question 24 asks, the, asks it this way. How does Christ carry out the office of a prophet? Here's the answer. Christ carries out the office of a prophet in revealing to his people, notice, by his word and the spirit, the will of God for our salvation. Christ carries out the office of a prophet in revealing to his people, by his word and spirit, the will of God for our salvation. So here's important things. Let's see how the scripture talks about Christ being the revelation of of God and how God uses Christ as an agent of revelation. Notice in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and on. It says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, right? That's what we've been talking about. But, now, but, in, but in these last days, notice that there's a shift, there's a contrast. Long ago, many ways, God spoke to us through the prophets. But now, what is he going to say? But now, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, Jesus Christ is God speaking to us. He's literally called the Word. And so it says, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Jesus is the revelation of God. And Jesus, let's say it this way, Jesus is the final word. There was lots of words that God gave in the Old Testament, but once Jesus came, it was the fullness of the revelation that God had to give to humanity. Once you see Jesus, once you understand Jesus, you understand God. You understand God's salvation. You understand what God is doing in this world, and you know exactly. You, have the, you now can see, you have, you have an option to see now who God actually is. Notice this talk about Jesus being light. What does light do? When you turn on the light, what happens? It reveals the room. Right? Jesus is light. Look what it says in, in John 1, 4 and 5. It says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. See? We were all in darkness, and Jesus comes in to shine his light, his truth about who God is and about how to get saved. And the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus' light is more victorious than sinful darkness. Can we say amen to that? Jesus' light is more victorious than sinful darkness. Praise the Lord for Jesus. Verse 9, it says, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. This is why Jesus had to come, because he reveals the truth about God and the truth about our salvation. I love this scene, this, this next scene. It's, it's Jesus coming up, starting his public ministry, and he steps into the synagogue, which was normal. It was as his custom in Luke chapter 4. What happened? On the Sabbath, they would read the scriptures, the scroll. From, they would read. And it was Jesus' turn to read the particular passage. And what happens in this next passage shows that Jesus saw himself as the prophesied true Messiah come straight from God by the power of his spirit. Let's read this in, in Luke 4, starting in verse 18. Look what Jesus says. He quotes from, from Isaiah. He literally uses the word of God and speaks it out. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, there's Messiah, to proclaim. Proclaim, what is that? That's a speaking verb, right? To proclaim. Jesus is our prophet who speaks. 
He reveals to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering the sight to the blind. Notice all these understanding, hearing language, speaking language. Jesus reveals, and he's, and he's saying, to set liberty to those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He said, he said those, those, uh, that from the scroll, and look at in verse 20. It says, and he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and all the eyes, all the eyes of all the, the synagogue were fixed on him. Everybody's looking at Jesus when he just, you know, like we stand to read the reading of the word. Well, that was going on, and, and everybody's looking at Jesus as he read that. And then what happens? What does Jesus say, verse 21? And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus goes, I am that Messiah who has come to proclaim God's truth to you, to, to proclaim liberty, to proclaim truth, to proclaim, to, to release the captives. Jesus saw himself as this prophet and says, that's me. Here I am. We need Jesus to be God's prophet, to play the mediatory role, to tell us the truth about God. Because we can't see God, we can't understand God unless God tells us about God. And that's through Jesus. In fact, um, the next verses show this, that he he saw himself not only as that Messiah, but look look at this. The people understood him to be this prophet. Look at what's going on here, because they rejected him. In In fact, verse 23 says, And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, meaning Jesus is already anticipating what people are going to say about this. He said, You're going to quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. Meaning like, hey, if you're, you're all mighty and powerful, then do something, do, like help yourself out, Mr. Mighty Guy. And then he says, <clears throat> what you have heard, you did it at Capernaum. Do it here in your hometown as well. Jesus was rejected in his hometown. He did miracles, he did preaching, but in his hometown he was rejected. And in verse 24, look what Jesus says. And he said, truly, truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. Jesus understood himself to be that rejected prophet from his hometown. It's like, look, I, it's, like, it's true. Isn't it true? If you know somebody, you're familiar with them, you grow up with them, they go, up to, they go on to be some major person in their hometown. People go, yeah, he's not a big deal. We know him. Well, that was true even for Jesus. He understood himself to be the rejected prophet of his hometown. But praise the Lord that he is the one, the true, the prophesied prophet that was to come from God. And so there's a couple things that Jesus does. When he prophesies, when he essentially preaches, when he preaches, he does two things. He preaches externally to our hearts, meaning he tells us the will of God. He tells us about God, and he tells us the will of God. And he does that externally, meaning we hear that through, through the preaching of the word. Did you know that every time there's a preacher up here or anywhere in any uh, church of God who is rightfully preaching the true word of God, that now Jesus preaches through that word. In fact, Paul says that really clearly in Thessalonians, that he praises the Thessalonians for receiving him because he says, you received my word as what it truly was, not a, man, or not a word from man, but a word from God. So Jesus preaches now through human agents to preach the word of God because we have the word of God. And whenever we have the word of God, Whenever that is rightly preached and taught and exhorted and warned, that is Jesus himself preaching through that externally, through, through the, the hearing of my voice, through the hearing of any preacher's voice, faithful preacher, that is Jesus doing that. He did that while he was on earth. He preached, but now he does that through the, the working of the Holy Spirit. There's an external preaching, but there's also an internal preaching. And what that means is he uses the Holy Spirit to help open up our hearts and our minds. He uses an internal Holy, ministry of the Holy Spirit to preach to us. So let me show you how this is true. Because after Jesus resurrected, look what, look what he says and look what he does um, in, in Luke 24 about opening up people's eyes to understand who God is in salvation. Uh, Luke 24, verse 44. It says, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, that's the whole Old Testament, that everything written in me about, all the things that are written about me in all of the Old Testament must be fulfilled. It says, then he opened their, eye, their minds to understand the scriptures. Jesus preaches to us through the preaching of the word, but then he uses the ministry of the Holy Spirit to open up our eyes to understand, oh, 
We need God. We need this truth. That's true about me. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I need the Spirit. I need grace. I, Lord, I need faith. I don't trust you. I need to trust you. Help me trust you. Well, when the lights go on, it's because Jesus is being our prophet. And he's sending his Holy Spirit to open up our hearts and our minds. Let's just see a few more things about how Jesus reveals God. He says it so clearly in, in, when he prayed when he's praying to God on our behalf. In John 17, often called the high priestly prayer, I'm sure we'll see more of that next week as we deal with Christ as our priest. But look what Jesus says about us. He says, O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. These are his disciples. And I made known to them your name. Look what Jesus does. I made known to them your name, Father, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Jesus reveals the Father to us so that we can be loved by the Father. And Jesus also reveals how to do that. It's through salvation. It's through belief in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of our sins that we may have salvation. Look what uh, John chapter 4, verse 41 and 42. It says, and many more believed because of the word. What? Because of the word. Because of the preaching. That's what that is. There was words being preached, and people believed because they were preached or preached to. And he said to the woman, oh, this was the, the woman at the well. She went back, and she told the word, and the word spread, and everybody kept proclaiming, Christ is Savior. Christ is Savior. He's come. And it says, and he said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. The Samaritans are going, oh, their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened. People shared the testimony of the truth of God's saving work, and Jesus used the preaching, the teaching of that word to open up people's eyes to see he's the Savior. And our, our last word for this morning is this, John chapter 20. It says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which were not written in this book. There was, it's not possible to have written down everything that Jesus did or said. That these, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. There it is, Christ the mediator, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Church, we need Christ to be our prophet. We need Christ to be our prophet and teaching us the truth about God. We need to know the truth about ourselves, that we're broken and sinful, but we also need to know the good news, that he, Jesus did not leave us in that broken, sinful state. No, he came to earth so that he can be in our place. He could, he could live the law, righteous law, that we could not follow. And so that he could preach to us and teach to us, tell us about who God is. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The, the, the disciples say, Jesus, show us the Father. He goes, how long have you been with me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We need to see God the Father, and we see that in the face of Jesus Christ. We need to know, understand our need for salvation. We see that in the preaching and the teaching and explicitly in belief in Jesus Christ. And so this morning, as we, as we consider this Christmas season, may we be so grateful for what Jesus has done. Let me ask you this question. Do you love and cherish Jesus for shining his light into our darkness? Do you love him? Do you cherish him? Are you grateful to him? Do you see that you need his light to expose our darkness? That's part of the issue is that we just think too highly of ourselves and we can't rightly see things. We need Jesus to show them. We need the word of God to expose them. We need to be given the good news that, hey, even though humanity is in utter broken darkness, there is true light available. Believe in him, receive forgiveness of sin, and have communion with him in his name. Let's do that. Let's believe him and receive him and obey him. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for being our prophet. Thank you for re revealing God to us. Thank you for revealing salvation to us. We have no chance. We're in utter darkness without you. But thank you for sending your spirit to open up our hearts, to open up our minds. And to, Lord, thank you that you're continuing to speak to us through, through the, the spoken word, through the preached word. Thank you that you, you love us, that you would have your word written down for us to be guarded and protected throughout the ages for 2,000 years. Lord, for more, for 4,000 years, you've had your words protected and guarded for us to hear so that we can know you, 
So Lord, this Christmas season, may we, may we focus on your goodness. May we focus on your work. May we focus on how you change everything by shining your light in our darkness. It's for your glory that we sing and we pray. It's in your name. Amen. Amen.